Discover Geography, Lesson 7-1, Climatology, Part 1. In this series of lessons, we're going to be talking about climate. So the first thing we want to do is distinguish climate from weather. Both of these terms describe the conditions of our Earth's atmosphere at a particular place. Climate refers to the long-term average atmospheric conditions, whereas weather refers to the short-term atmospheric conditions. For example, on the day that I'm recording this video, the weather where I am is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. The climate in my location is a cold winter, warm summer climate with consistent moderate levels of precipitation year-round. In other words, climate describes what typically happens in a place. Weather describes what's actually happening right now. We can describe the climate of any particular place by describing the average temperature for each month across the course of the year and the average precipitation for each month across the course of the year. And you see in these two animated maps those temperatures and precipitation levels for the various parts of the Earth over the course of a year. We can summarize these temperatures and precipitations in something called a climograph. On a climograph, the line represents the average monthly temperature of the place. The bars represent the average monthly precipitation. So if we look at the climograph for Boston, Massachusetts, we see that the temperature in Boston ranges from a little below freezing in the winter up into the low 20s Celsius in the summer. Precipitation in Boston is pretty consistently about 10 centimeters of precipitation every month. If we look at the climograph for Calcutta, India, what we see is the temperatures in Calcutta are pretty consistent throughout the year, about 30 degrees Celsius with a little bit of a dip in the middle of winter. On the other hand, precipitation in Calcutta has a striking seasonal difference with very little precipitation in the winter and a huge amount of precipitation, up to 30 centimeters a month in the middle of the summer. Looking at Christchurch, New Zealand, we see a pattern very similar to what we saw in Boston with a big seasonal difference in temperature and consistent moderate levels of precipitation year-round. The big difference between Boston and Christchurch is that Christchurch is having its winter at the same time that Boston is having its summer and vice versa because Christchurch is in the southern hemisphere whereas Boston is in the northern hemisphere and the seasons in the northern and southern hemispheres are opposite from each other. When we look at a map of climates around the world, it may at first look like a very complex situation. We have a lot of different climate types in a lot of different sorts of places. But in fact, we can break down the factors that influence climate into a short list of principles. And between these principles, we can explain the climates of any place in the world. In this lesson, we're going to look at those principles that influence the temperatures of different parts of the world. In the next lesson, we'll look at those principles that influence the precipitation levels in different parts of the world. The first and most important thing that influences temperature is latitude. In general, the closer you are to the equator, the warmer it's going to be, and the closer you are to the poles, the colder it's going to be. The reason for this has to do with the way the Earth is absorbing the sun's radiation. When the sun's radiation comes down at the equator, it's going to hit from pretty directly above. The curvature of the Earth means that the equator is facing pretty directly into the sun. And so a beam of sunlight of a certain width is going to hit the Earth from directly above. And so that sunlight is going to be concentrated on a very small patch of ground, which means that a given area of ground is going to receive a lot of solar energy. And this is going to lead to warm temperatures. On the other hand, because of the curvature of the Earth, areas closer to the poles are going to be tilted away from the sun, which means that as that solar radiation comes in, it's going to come in at a low angle, and a beam of sunlight of a certain width is going to be spread out over a lot more land, which means that any given spot of land is going to get less solar energy, and so therefore we're going to see colder temperatures. The angle at which a given part of the Earth is facing into the sun is going to vary over the course of the year. This is the explanation for why we have seasons. Seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis. The Earth's axis is tilted 
at about 23 and a half degrees away from being perfectly straight up and down. And the tilt of that Earth's axis is always pointing towards the same spot in the universe. So that means that as the Earth revolves around the Sun, sometimes the northern hemisphere is going to be tilted towards the Sun, other times the southern hemisphere is going to be tilted towards the Sun. When your hemisphere is tilted towards the Sun, you're going to get warmer temperatures and you're going to have summer. When your hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun, you're going to get colder temperatures and you're going to have winter. It's a common misconception that seasons have something to do with the distance of the Earth from the Sun. But in fact, the Earth is actually closer to the Sun during the Northern Hemisphere winter and farther from the Sun during the Northern Hemisphere summer. Further, if distance from the Sun was a big factor in influencing seasons, we would have the same seasons in both hemispheres. We would have winter at the same time when the Earth was closer to the Sun and summer at the same time when the Earth was farther away. But in fact, what we have is a pattern where we have winter in the Northern Hemisphere at the same time we're having summer in the Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. The tilt of the Earth towards or away from the Sun is going to influence seasonal temperatures in two ways. First, if your hemisphere is tilted towards the Sun, that means that solar energy is going to come down more directly. The Sun is going to be closer to directly overhead, so you're going to get more concentrated solar radiation. On the other hand, if your hemisphere is tilted away from the Sun, the Sun is going to be at a lower angle in the sky. That solar radiation is going to get spread out over more land, and so you're going to have less concentrated solar radiation. The other factor shaping seasonal temperature differences has to do with the amount of time that you spend getting sunlight. If you look at the diagram there, if you focus on the Earth on the left-hand side of the diagram, so this is northern hemisphere summer, southern hemisphere winter. If you imagine a point on the Earth rotating around that tilted axis, if it's close to the northern pole, that point on the Earth is going to spend more than half of its rotation in the sunlit half of the Earth and less than half in the dark half of the Earth. On the other hand, a point similarly close to the southern pole is going to spend more than half of its rotation in the dark half of the Earth and less than half in the light portion of the Earth. So that means that not only is sunlight more directly overhead during the summer when your hemisphere is tilted towards the Earth, but you're going to be getting that concentrated sunlight for a longer period of time. You're going to be getting that for more than 12 hours during the day, whereas in the winter, not only is that sunlight going to be more diffuse, coming in at a lower angle, but you're only going to get that for less than 12 hours of the day. And in fact, if you get close enough to one of the poles, you may be able to rotate all the way around the Earth without leaving the sunlit half during the summer or without leaving the dark half of the Earth during the winter. That is, you might get sunlight the entire day or get no sunlight at all, depending on the season. So between the angle of the sun's light and the length of the time that you're getting that sunlight each day, we're going to get colder temperatures during the winter when your hemisphere is tilted away from the sun and warmer temperatures during the summer when your hemisphere is tilted in towards the sun. And if we look at the amount of solar radiation received by a given spot on the Earth at different points during the year, what we see is that near the equator, the variation in solar radiation over the course of the year is very moderate. The change in the angle of the sun's light and the change in the length of day near the equator only vary a little bit. And so not only is it overall warmer closer to the equator, but we also see less seasonal variation in temperature close to the equator. As we move towards the poles, what we see is that not only does it get overall colder, but we also see greater seasonal variation in temperatures, a bigger difference between how warm it is in the summer and how cold it is in the winter. And as we get up right to the poles, we see the most extreme differences between winter and summer temperature, in addition to being overall colder than it would be near the equator. So we see greater seasonal differences and colder temperatures in more polar areas, less seasonal differences in temperature and overall warmer temperatures near the equator. Another important factor that influences temperatures is being close to the land versus being close to the water. Water heats up and cools down much more slowly than does land. 
when the sun is shining, the land will heat up very quickly, the ocean will heat up more slowly. When the sun is not shining, land will cool off very quickly, the ocean will cool off much more slowly. This means that places that are close to a large body of water are going to see more moderate temperature differences both between night and day and between summer and winter. On the other hand, places that are far inland are going to see big temperature differences both between night and day and between summer and winter. On the slide, you see a comparison of the climographs for the cities of San Francisco and Sacramento, California. San Francisco is right on the Pacific Ocean. It's surrounded by water on three sides. On the other hand, Sacramento is not far away, but it's fully inland. And you can see by comparing the temperature lines on these two climographs that the amount of variation between the summer and winter temperatures in San Francisco is much more moderate than the variation between summer and winter temperatures in Sacramento. Another important factor that influences temperature is altitude. Overall, it gets colder as you go up in the mountains. And what you see on your slide here is an example of what's called altitudinal zonation in the Andes Mountains of South America. The Andes were where this phenomenon was first clearly documented, that you get distinct climate zones getting colder as you go up into the mountains. So in the Andes, these zones are referred to by names in Spanish, and you see on the diagram there some of the crops that can be grown in each of these temperature zones. So if we start from the bottom of the mountain, we're in the Tierra Caliente, which is Spanish for hot land. And you see you can grow tropical crops there, like sugar cane and rubber and bananas. As we go up the mountain, we get into the Tierra Templada, which is Spanish for temperate land. And you can grow temperate zone crops there, like maize and cotton. As you go up even farther, you get into the Tierra Fria, which is Spanish for cold land, where you can grow cold weather crops like potatoes and barley. And as you get all the way up to the top of the mountain, you get to the Tierra Helada, which is Spanish for icy land, where you can herd llamas but can't really grow any crops because it's gotten too cold. So that way we can see ice-capped mountains even right at the equator. If they are tall enough, if they're high enough up in altitude, the temperature will be cold enough to sustain ice and snow even though at the base of the mountain it may be incredibly warm. This altitudinal zonation was a very useful thing to the native people living in this area because you have a great variety of climate zones over a very short distance. And so a clan or a tribe would often control a slice of land running from the top of the mountain to the bottom so that they could grow all the different crops that could be grown in all of these different climate zones. The last factor that we want to look at influencing temperature is ocean currents. If you have a warm current running along a coast near you, then that's going to overall increase your temperature. If you have a cold current running along your coast, that's going to bring your temperature down. If your current is running from the equator towards the poles, that's going to be a warm current. It's going to bring warm water from the equator up the coast and warm up the temperatures nearby. If your current is flowing from the poles towards the equator, that's going to be a cold current. It's going to bring cold water from the poles down along the coast and cool you off. Now looking at this ocean current map, you may notice that in each of our major ocean basins, we have a series of currents flowing essentially in a circle. These are known as ocean gyres. There you can see there are five major ones, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, and then the Indian Ocean. Furthermore, you may notice that the two northern hemisphere gyres both circulate in a clockwise direction, and the three southern hemisphere gyres all circulate in a counterclockwise direction. That means that the east coasts of continents are always getting warm currents flowing along them, and the west coasts are always getting cold currents. The reason for these directional circulation of these gyres is something called the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is a phenomenon that leads to things moving across the surface of the Earth being deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere from the perspective of an observer standing on the Earth. The Coriolis effect affects anything that's moving freely over a long distance. So the Coriolis effect is going to shape the flow of ocean currents. It's going to shape the flow of winds in the atmosphere. It may affect 
a missile or an airplane flying over a long distance. The Coriolis effect is caused by the rotation of the Earth. Essentially, the Earth is rotating faster near the equator than it is near the poles. To illustrate that, let's imagine we're looking down at the Earth from above the North Pole. If I'm standing close to the North Pole, let's say I'm standing one meter south of the North Pole, that means that in one day, I'm going to rotate once around the Earth's axis. And so if I'm one meter from the North Pole, that means that the circle that I'm going to make over the course of one day is 3.14 meters. So I'm moving at a speed of 3.14 meters per day around the Earth. On the other hand, if I have a friend standing at the equator, the equator is going to have to make it all the way around the Earth in one day as well. But the circumference of the Earth at the equator is 40,000 kilometers. So my friend at the equator is moving at 40 million meters per day to make that same rotation around the Earth that I'm making. So things close to the poles are rotating much more slowly around the Earth than things near the equator. And so when something moves across the surface of the Earth, it's going to continue to rotate at the speed that it was moving in the place that it left from, even though the place that it's moving towards may be rotating at a very different speed. So as an example, let's imagine that I want to throw a paper airplane from my position near the North Pole to my friend at the equator. So I have a really good arm. I can throw a paper airplane that entire distance. That airplane is rotating along with me at 3.14 meters per day. My friend, of course, is rotating much faster at the equator. So I'm going to try to throw this airplane directly at where my friend currently is. The Earth is going to start to rotate. And so my friend is going to rotate very fast. The airplane is going to continue to rotate at 3.14 meters per day. And so as it moves, it's going to essentially lag behind everything else on the Earth. So you can see the airplane has rotated from where it was when I threw it, but it hasn't rotated as much as the rest of the Earth. It hasn't rotated as much as that line directly from me to my friend that I was trying to throw the airplane along. And so as the airplane flies, it continues to rotate, but the Earth continues to rotate faster away from it. And so if we look at the path that the airplane took across the Earth, if we look at all the spots the airplane passed over, it looks to us, standing on the Earth, like that airplane veered to the right as it flew. In fact, it didn't veer to the right from the perspective of us in space looking down at the Earth. But from the perspective of someone standing on the Earth, it did appear to veer to the right. So that's the essence of the Coriolis effect that because things close to the poles are rotating much more slowly around the Earth than things at the equator, anything that's trying to move across the Earth is going to either lag behind or get ahead of its destination, and therefore, from the perspective of an observer on the Earth, is going to appear to veer to one side. Because of the direction of the rotation of the Earth, things in the northern hemisphere are going to seem to veer to the right, things in the southern hemisphere are going to seem to veer to the left. So if we look at our ocean currents, so if we look at our ocean, we see that those gyres in the northern hemisphere are essentially veering to the right as they flow. And if you keep veering to the right, you're eventually going to make a circle around in a clockwise direction. Likewise, in the southern hemisphere, those currents are constantly veering to the left. And so they ultimately make a circle in a counterclockwise direction. Now, because the locations of the poles and the equator are swapped in the two hemispheres, that leads to having a warm current on the east coast of any continent, either running from north to south in the southern hemisphere or from south to north in the northern hemisphere, and then a cold current along the western hemisphere, the western side of any continent. So therefore, the eastern sides of continents will tend to be a little warmer than the climates on the western sides of those continents.